Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Ramoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello, and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast here at Blab. I am your host, as always, Peter Ramoliotis, and on Twitter, I go as PD Beats. This is the podcast where we have digital dialogues in the worlds of social media, sports, pop culture, and tonight is our Tech Talk episode. We are going to talk about digital media, we're going to talk about apps, we're going to talk about social media, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, um, but first I'm going to introduce the panel really quickly uh, that we have. Um, we have Operations Associate at Vayner Media. we have Garrett Green. Garrett, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here, excited. Appreciate you having me. No problem. And we have a digital media strategist. We have Chris Giles. Chris, welcome. Cool. Thanks, Peter, for having me. And we had Lisa Bettany, but <laughs> we we're going to hope to wait for the call back in and wait for it. <laughs> and, and we have photographer and co-founder of the app Camera Plus, Lisa Bettany. Lisa, welcome to the show. Hello. So this is the, the the time on Pop Alternative where we let the guests go around and introduce themselves and uh, give us a little bit more of a background before we get into like the meat and the potatoes. So Lisa, let's start with you. A little bio opening remarks. Sure. Well, um, I'm co-founder of the camera app Camera Plus, and I guess for the last eight years I've been working in technology, but also as a photographer and. Now I'm semi-retired. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I just kind of do my own thing. Um, I started my blog again. I'm always kind of looking for new projects, and I've kind of done five apps now, and I'm kind of thinking I want to move into a different space. So that's me. Cool. Chris, what about you? Uh, during the day, I work at the Niagara Parks Commission, uh, work in the marketing department there, uh, digital media coordinator, and then I do some freelance stuff on my own, some consulting, um, pretty much anything digital, social media, anything like that. Very cool. And last, but of course not least, Gary Green. Gary, uh, Gary you're with uh, Vayner Media, correct? That is correct. In fact, uh, today I, I started exactly one year ago to this day. So a uh, pretty exciting day around the office, getting to talk to people about how the year has flown by. But uh, so I worked as a community manager on a couple of our big accounts for about 10, about 11 months. And then a month ago, I moved down to our operations team to uh, make sure this place is making money while staying awesome and growing at the rapid rate that we do. Um, but yeah, I've done back in the past a lot of uh, kind of digital strategists and things like that on a case-to-case -case basis and uh, always wanted to work for the big man Gary Vaynerchuk and finally decided to move to New York to do it. So that's what I'm here. And he he's already threatened me on Twitter publicly that if I don't plug tonight, he's going to be on CNBC, this awesome show where they follow leaders and CEOs around. Um, so everyone should uh, check it out or at the least check your DVR. That way you don't have to watch commercials. But uh, CNBC, <laughs> 10 o'clock Eastern tonight, uh, hook it up. He, you'll, see, you'll see how crazy the man really is. He works his ass off 23 and a half hours a day, it seems. Uh, I would <laughs> love to have Gary Vaynerchuk on Pop Alternative. That would be unbelievable. He is that, – that, that, that's amazing that he wanted you to plug something on my show. That's, <laughs> that, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, um, thank you all for being on the show. It's going to be a really cool episode. Um, I think we're going to be able to have some insightful chats about all the stuff that's going on in digital media and social media and apps and, you know, Lisa having camera, uh, her experience with camera plus, I find it would be a really interesting <laughs> conversation to talk about social media is a, you know, very effective, you know, cost effective tool. It's uh, at times, um, it's can very, be. yeah, it can be. <laughs> I, I actually paused to, to realize it can be. Um, but the one thing about it too is it, it, it does, it does have this ability to give a lot more people exposure and to, you know, start, start a social media account or a blog. And the one thing that came to mind was startup companies and startup companies, 
I think that would kind of be their wheelhouse to get on social media, capitalize on social media's ability to, you know, um, get messaging out. So my first question is in a saturated market of social media, because one of the problems with social media is everyone has that. A lot of people have access to it. Everyone can make a Twitter account. Everyone can make a social account. These startup companies that are trying to get their products out there, how could they stand out on social media? What are some of the tactics that you, all three of you and your past experiences with social media have come across in terms of getting your brand established and differentiating yourself from the crowd? Garrett, uh, Garrett or Lisa or Chris, anyone want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, I've always tried to remain on authentic. And I think in today's world with so many voices out there, you have to have a strong, authentic voice. And I think the people that have maintained this authenticity and have remained genuine with people. I mean, Gary is a really good person. I remember him from Wine Library TV days. I mean, he's, he's someone that you hear his voice online and you know him. Like you feel like you can reach out and touch him almost because he's that big. Um, <laughs> but for me, you know, I, I, I try to speak with my own voice and, you know, I've been struggling with that over the last, say, you know, three years because I've been promoting camera Plus so heavily and I've kind of lost my own authentic voice. And I think my fans kind of dropped. Like I lost a lot of fans because they lost that ability to to know about who I actually am because there are plenty of faces out there and it's about standing out really um, like p having a personality saying something I think people are kind of scared to, to speak an opinion these days because everything is just so saccharine and just yeah. oh look at this rainbow photo blah 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 but the, but you know you look at Trump mm. and how that's polarized people how people oh, yeah. are talking about that it's a controversy. People want an opinion. And when I say an opinion or even just something, you know, kind of out in left field, something interesting, I think people kind of like that. And, and you see campaigns with brands that actually do that now. They do something kind of snarky or sarcastic and maybe they get backlash, but ultimately they're going to get more people talking about it. Yeah, no, you bring up some good points. Chris, what do you think about that that aspect of it and the, like being – consistent too with with your brand as well yeah i can definitely understand with uh lisa saying in terms of you have an obligation to a brand that you're representing and then that can kind of at times hinder you in the in what you want to go about in your own kind of personal endeavors um so that can be a challenge kind of balancing that but i think the biggest thing in terms of um if you're a startup and you're looking to grow an audience is just providing value to your your followers like why is somebody going to follow your brand they have no allegiance to you uh, they're not a past customer. You don't have a relationship with them. So what are you going to give them um, off the bat that's going to entice them, first of all, to follow you, but then also to continue that relationship? So what um, consistently are you providing to them in terms of value, whether that's yeah. content? Um, content, ideally, the problem with that, I guess, for a lot of startups is the time issue, right? People say, oh, I don't have time to make this content or um, whatever. There's other ways to go about it. Maybe they do contests and stuff like that, but that has a lifespan as well. You can't just keep doing contests over and over and over again. Um, so it's, I guess, back to Lisa's point, I guess, creating a unique voice for your brand and then um, kind of communicating that and finding the value and why is why is somebody going to follow your account and what can you consistently fill their newsfeed with in terms of, in terms of value. Yeah. And Garrett, that that's really interesting. And and um, can can a, can a lot of what Chris and Lisa said relate to your work at VaynerMedia? Yeah, I, I think it definitely can. I uh, I think that as Chris talks about providing value to your followers or your potential potential customers, different consumers out there is what it's all about. It's what it's the most important part. And hopefully, you're trying to push a product, service, idea, something that is valuable in itself. I think you, we've all seen situations of this brand may be great on social media or I enjoyed s interacting with this piece of content, but their product is crappy or overpriced or not relevant to me and vice versa. Uh, I've come across thing, products I love and then gone online and see their, ter their terrible presence or a voice done wrong. Um, I think it, it's, it's 
even more under the microscope for things like startups. But at, like in our work, we work with Fortune 500 and, a, and bigger brands, and, and it's still extremely relevant. And that's where your your content has to be still really value and tell an even more engaging story. Um, and to Lisa's point, I really liked that if you can take a stand and not uh, – the biggest issue these days is so many brands and people and are – land online they're too afraid to go one side of the road on any decision any idea um and i really think now you're, you're starting to see you, we're past that tipping point of you're better off mm -hmm. being transparent and honest and showing what you or your brand stands for or thinks or how that voice would interact with pop culture events than trying to during the super bowl being a restaurant and saying Chicken wings are great, aren't they? Hope you're enjoying the game. <laughs> How many times you can get hit with that ad? <laughs> yeah. Things like that, I think, drive people crazy. And, and especially if you work in the industry, I'll, I'll get served ad, generic sounding, generic copy on ads and generic creative like that. And all I want to do is mock it all day. Because <laughs> it's not going to be. People just ignore it at the end of the day. Like, exactly. If it's not different, then they're not going to pay attention to it. It's every, every, every timeline, news feed, whatever it is, is busy and cluttered. And you have to stand out in a good way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but what do you think of, I, I mean, what, what do you think? Like, you all mentioned the whole concept of, like, you're using social media to promote and, and uh, sell a product. But where, where do we draw the line where our content does not come off, like, super, super sponsory and pitchy? And has that, because uh, the, the bottom line is, yes, we are trying to sell a product, but there is a epidemic of automated tweets and automated direct messages and automatic emails about, hey, use my product. Hey, use this. Check this out. And to be your own, but it, it bothers me a lot where someone messages me and, you know, wants to have a conversation about something and then it ends up just being a sales pitch. Um, you know, I, I understand that it, they're trying to make a living, but could we not strike a balance, Lisa, where it, like, it doesn't come off super pitchy? I mean, Camera Plus has never overtly marketed, which is kind of a crazy concept if you think about it. But yeah. back in the early days when we launched the app, um, the App Store marketed it for us. We didn't have to do anything. It was in the top 10 for three years, and that's all we needed. So we never spent any money. We were never – we had some contests, but, you know, I was fortunate in that – my app was something visual, so I could just create beautiful content and then say I took it with my app. So I never had to be, I've been, I mean, I'm Canadian, so I'm humble and polite, and yeah. I'm not very loud. And yeah, Apple uh, stole your uh, marketing idea, by the way. It's the nearest iPhone. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I think for... For me, I, I try to keep most of my content to be the valuable content. So yep. I will give. I give and I give and I give. And that's what creates a loyal fan base for me. Because I'm not just promoting an app. I'm promoting my whole brand and wherever that brand will go. Maybe I'll write a book. Maybe I'll do something else. Yeah. I don't know. But it's important to me to, to keep that that fan base happy and so I provide them with valuable content I tell them how to take great pictures and so it's never I've never been very um, overt about you know buy my app and uh, you know I, I hope that that has made my audience trust me a bit more and yeah. but I you know I one topic that I think is really interesting is how the the generation that's coming up isn't really aware of this like they're no. not clued into what is an ad and what isn't an ad, and they actually don't care. Our generation cares. If somebody tries to sell me something, I am not going to book. Nope, nope, nope. Like, you just put that yeah. in my face. And, but now you see, you know, Instagrammers selling their shoes and their clothing and their vacation. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> click, 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 yeah. And I'm, no, thinking, I'm thinking, one, That is never, in, you know, Republic vacations. So why are you even bothering, you know, with stuff like that? But 
I, I think that they're not aware. And so I think the tactics that you can use to reach a younger audience is pretty overt and pretty blatant. Yeah. Like you can be, mm -hmm. here are these shoes, like hashtag ad. And that's how it is these days. Because they don't want to be tricked. Like they'll reject that more so than yeah, the overt exactly. ad. Right? Exactly. Like, you, it's, not, it's not about being sneaky anymore. It's about being, yeah. you know, hey, I was paid to do this. And then they're like, oh, that's cool. That person was paid to do that. Maybe I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Garrett, what do you think about about that? Um I agree with a ton of it. I think that especially then when you talk about like seeing an influencer or someone that they see interact online a lot that is like, hey, I got paid to do this or use this product. I think a lot of young people see that as, you know, I never really cared what type of cracker or chips I bought, but the fact that they that they worked with yada yada, mm -hmm. that's pretty sweet. And if they're gonna help support him or her, then I like I I might as well buy those if I don't care so much. Um and I think that's a pretty like upfront play that a lot of brands will do. But I think like what a lot of people won't understand about social media is that it's the really long term game. It's the it's the very long value game. Um, and that's why you can give and give and give and give. Um, and it's something that, like, that Gary Vee preaches a lot, that if you give, 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 and you realize the long-term value of someone, you earn yourself the right to ask. Um, and that's I think a, really, that's why that's like a great it. point. And so we've seen a lot of people just asking, buy this, click this, read this, watch this. And then it kind of got overcorrected, and it was everyone – you still got to make money at some mm -hmm. point. If you still have a goal or a business objective, you have to reach it somehow. And I think brands are starting to realize they've earned the right to ask that. I think like like Taco Bell is a great mm -hmm. example. Like when they pulled everything and if you tweeted at them, they're like, hey, we're no longer here, but you can find us on the app. You should download it. Yeah. It didn't feel uncomfortable or wrong because their brand's voice had done so much fun, goofy, awesome stuff that so many people had enjoyed that it was like, you know, I'm not going to download it, but I'm not upset either. Or, fine, that sounds cool. I wonder why Taco Bell is an app. I'll check it out. Mm -hmm. And this, and before, because Chris, I had a specific question for you because I know you have a lot of experience in content strategy as well. But um, I think the point that Lisa and Garrett, you made about the give, give is um, I use my social media and pop to social media as I'm not afraid to ask people, hey, we have a cool episode coming up. Can you retweet or share this? But I know that they need the pe people need to know that I pride myself on being that guy that will help people no matter what. If they have something they want to promote, I'm there for them. If they have an article that they've written, I'm there for them. I am, I am really open to helping people extend their network and connecting people. And the reason I bring this up is because this is one of the reasons why I made Poptarnative. I thought it was a really good opportunity to kind of get amazing guests like all, all of you together, exchange ideas, and then connect after. Because after this episode, you know, there will be some direct messages. Hey, it was cool being on the show. Cool. You made a connection. Down the road, if there's, if there's something that, like, like if Lisa posts something, you, there's a good chance that you'll get some retweets from Garrett, Chris, and I. You know what I mean? That that that's that's the the nature of the game, in my opinion. It's a tip for tat. It's 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 a give and take. Yeah. I don't like the take take take, and there is a lot of that. But that's for another um that that's for another conversation. But Chris, my question for you is, you have to have this like. If you're putting together a content calendar or content strategy for a brand, there are the, the engaging posts and you know the 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 live amazing spontaneous posts to get everyone talking. But you gotta have the quote unquote maybe boring or sponsored or like the nest the post that you need to put in, right? Like your your boss comes up. Yeah, we put those on Facebook. We have to you'll tweet this to link to our ah. website or something. Um, <laughs> but my my question um for you is do you how do you go about about that are there ways to make those you know um click links like those posts that are are purposely there just for some to click and check out or buy something is there a way to make them fun and less um, sponsor like is there, is there, is there like a strategy like around that so if, if we have an event coming up 
um, at my work, say it's something at uh, the Butterfly Conservatory, and uh, they have an event coming up. We'll we'll post a blog, maybe it has some educational content, some informational stuff, and then at the end uh, or kind of throughout, we'll we'll link to hey, you can buy your tickets here um, to get people reading and get people engaging with the content and possibly clicking. Like I would never say just have a straight up click click here to buy this because nobody's going to click on that um, generally. Like you, you run those to a point, I guess, still. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's just about kind of making it in with your content and giving people a reason to keep um, consuming it. Because as, as they consume along, they're going to they're going to take in your sales messaging uh, mixed in with your content, right? So if your content's compelling, um, yeah, and that's how you do that. No, um, absolutely. And, and Lisa and Garrett, this is something for you too, moving away. Uh, we talked about, you know, a lot of opportunity, a lot of people on social media. Starting a blog, if someone wants to start a blog, on the top of your head, what is like the first like piece of advice you can give them based on, you know, both of you have written blogs before. What are advice that you can give them in terms of whether it's you know, starting out or the type of content or the type of message? Is there anything that comes to your mind? Um, I, was, uh, I would say, you know, try to nail down what yeah. your, your goal is with the blog. Um, and it doesn't have to be that you want to be an expert in one area or hope that it leads to something. I mean, maybe you just want to be a better writer. Maybe you enjoy taking pictures and you want to talk about it at the experience of taking the pictures. Um, pinpoint, try to pinpoint what that is um, and understand what the value prop is. Uh, and when, if, it, if you want it to reach other people and maybe gain the masses and turn into something, reverse engineer it. Why would someone come there? Why would someone take time to read your blog, to care what you have to say, what you have to write, what you're sharing? Uh, if you can truly understand that and understand your audience, why they would come to you or, or consume your content, you're probably going to win if it's worth a damn. If you do a good job, you have a good chance of winning. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to mention that Garrett Green is the first pop alternative guest ever to live tweet the episode while he's on air. So I have to actually applaud you right now for the effort because I just have my, my notes here and I keep making notifications. It. And that's amazing. Yeah, I, got, I got the two windows open. Man, around, you know, I got the, the one over here and then I got my Twitter stream over here. I got to give us love, get us more attention. What are we up to? 21? Yeah. But before we go to Lisa, but before we go to Lisa, the one thing I have to tell you is, uh, because you plugged it at the beginning, so I'm going to plug something now, is you need to tell Gary Vaynerchuk about my dog and his social media account and how my my dog has over 100 people. Dude, your dog is killing it, and I'm super into like, the, the dogs that are viral thing. I'm obsessed with, uh, with Wally the Welsh Corgi, and I went to college with, with the Doug the Pug's human like yeah. Before Doug the Pug was super famous, yeah. So and he's like one of the the super oh. big ones. So yeah, I will, I will. Yeah, Cruzo, uh, the the Dash Hounds, they're they're from Ottawa as well. So isn't that kind of crazy that two big, <laughs> it's the, like two yeah, big because they, they were they dogs made that from Ottawa. Video, and I, was I thought like, that very interesting. Canadian. And then like last week they made one of the, yeah. uh, I think the Blue Jays, and I was like, okay, they're definitely Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Chris, they're from Ottawa Wait, as well. Is everyone right? else Canadian? Whoa, crazy, first right? Time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're the you're the odd, you're the odd man out. Yeah. Garrett's this the doesn't odd happen man often. I'm cool with it. <laughs> Love Canada. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's happened a couple times on the show, but it's been the other way around. I I've been the only non-American yeah. once. I've had three American guests on and. I caught, uh, it was meant, I had, maybe you know them, I had Justin Hart from Pac-12 Networks, and then I had Chris Yandel, who does Georgia Tech Athletics, okay. and Jenny Hogan, who works at Tagboard, and the episode we had with them was kind of a similar episode here, but yeah, I started to sidetrack Lisa, uh, blog advice, because you said you recently re like uh, went back to your blog, um, I think Garrett brought some good points. Anything specifically more? Um, about, well, know, for the, me, I mean, I started a blog or the style. eight years ago, and I kind of abandoned it for, for Facebook. Years ago, 
because of the algorithm on that network, it made it almost impossible to share anything and get any feedback. So, I mean, at that point I was getting, you know, 10,000 likes on photos, my audience was building. And so it was just easier for me to post, you know, a picture on there and, you know, get my feedback there. But then recently I realized that all this content I've been putting on Facebook, I'm just giving it to them essentially. I'm giving it to them I'm give, I, and none of it's coming back to me. And it, when somebody searches me online, they don't find those things. You know, they're not as searchable and they're not, they don't live in my home that I control. Mm -hmm. And also I find that the voice I use on Facebook is very different from the voice I use on my blog. On my blog I have, you know, it's a strong voice, it's my voice. On Facebook yeah. it's kind of like, okay guys, um, here's a photo. You know, I hope you like it. <laughs> like, you don't want to offend anyone on Facebook because holy moly, that's a bad scene. Um, and I'll refer to uh, uh, a page. So I kind of lost all the content that I'd been posting because I separated those two pages. And now I'm reaching maybe 1%. 1% of my audience, and that's just not good enough. And um, so moving forward, I think for me, I had to redefine, again, what am I doing with this? Like, why are people coming here? Are they coming here to learn about me? Are they coming to learn about my photography? Because I've kind of done a lot of things. I've been in tech, I've been you know, doing the app thing, I'm a photographer. I've done you no know, TV hosting, all kinds of stuff. So I, I just wanted to create a home. And I think for a lot of people, they don't actually know what they want. You know, they're kind of creating a brand as they go. And so I think it's an important thing is about consistency. Mm -hmm. Because if you want people to continue to follow you, you have to keep putting out content and it has to be good content. And I think that's us, something a lot of us struggle with is to create that, yep. you know, that schedule of posting. And if you're just doing this for fun, that's kind of a hard thing. But if you really want to make a, a go out of it and, you know, I can, you know, at least for me, it really worked out. I started a blog and then based on that blog, I got an app and that app was very successful. And that, that was because of my blog, because people liked my personality on my blog. But I think, you know, going back to being authentic and having a strong voice and then what Garrett said, just really kind of nailing down what what your focus is, whether that's like for me, it's not definable, but it's, you know, there's a voice, there's a there's something in there. It's hard to say exactly what that is. But but, but Chris, um, would you like your social media? and content and your blog content work in tandem, right? Your social media is going to drive right. traffic on your blog. Your blog is going to drive traffic on your social media. Yeah, so exactly. Got, we're never going to do any they're, conversion they're, on they're social like media. Team. Well, not yet anyway. Maybe this, in the future that will change. But um, look at what a failure that Facebook stores were. Um, people aren't comfortable yet with the conversion aspect and kind of yeah. finishing sales on social media yet. So um, at, at the end of the day, you still have to – gently kind of bring them over to um, your e-commerce solution, your website, whatever you're doing with that. So um, kind of streamline the process for that, I guess, and, and making it not as alarming for them to get there, I guess, because that's where so many people get lost, right? We talk so much about how how long it really does take to, to win somebody over. And you can spoil that relationship very quickly being really overt with your sales. Like, um, So I think... At the end of the day, you, you have to bring them to the website somehow, um, and you have to get them from social. So that's where where it comes in. So the your social is is a kind of a um, a trailer or a, a tidbit of what they can expect. Mm -hmm. I'm sure for say for Lisa, your, your blog, you have so much more content on there than someone could ever find on your social channel. So maybe someone gets introduced mm -hmm. to you through your social channels. And then, oh, I like this. I yeah. want to learn more. And then that's where they mm -hmm. um, that's where they end up on your website, right? So I think it's really important to to connect with people as well. Like if they yeah. have taken the time to reach out to you, to email you, mm -hmm. to you know, at you on Twitter. I mean, I take so much time out of my day to respond to that. 
because I think it, that's really important because they've taken the time out of their day to reach you. And they, they want, <laughs> I responded to you, <laughs> but only because you I responded, wanted to be responded sober. to me. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I what think it's slightly exhausting to do all of them, you know, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and but you know, I do I try to give people Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> well, I think we lost Lisa oh. for the time, but uh, <laughs> um, no, but it, it's, she'll come back. I know she'll come back, but her, you know what? I, her, oh, well, she's back in. We've had, uh, we had Courtney Schoen from the Cleveland Cavaliers and her laptop died during the episode. So it just combined it like, turned off. <laughs> so, um, Yeah. We're having a lot of tech Wait, issues for that. Oh, no. Hey, it's Canadian Wi-Fi. I live in two a small for two. Town. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett's like Canadians. We just got internet on here. <laughs> hey man, I was born no, in Kentucky, I, so I, I know yeah. I'm in a small town and bad internet plenty well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think the connecting aspect is important, and that's what I think I'm I, I'm really capable of doing, and I love doing it. I love re – I'm not afraid to reach out. I think the thing that really bothers me about up-and-coming people, because I go to a lot of networking events and I talk to people, people are afraid to ask and network and meet people. And that's just from my past experiences, but I think that, you know, the the concept of of you asking for something and then people saying no to you and it maybe being someone that you looked up to like you know Garrett and Chris I know we're all big hockey fans you know but if you ask you know your favorite sports reporter your favorite hockey player a question and they say no that's kind of like a nightmare in some sense you don't want that to happen right but if you don't ask you know you you wouldn't get the possible yes that could have came right you never know right so. I, I think, Lisa, the problem, too, is people don't, in my opinion, don't network enough. And we should go around the panel because that is really important. Do you think people are, A, afraid to network, or B, don't know how to network properly? And when I talk about networking, I'm talking about, you know, what you said, messaging people, tweeting at them, emailing them. Or is it C? Is it is it all of the above, Garrett? What do you think about that? Like. Are we at a point where we're not – we haven't, like, um, mastered the craft have. yet? I think some people don't know how to take your offline networking and human-to-human -human interaction online for the sake of this conversation. Um, and I think a lot of people are lazy. Uh, I think it was you that brought it up before, you know, following someone on Twitter and getting that auto DM. I probably have like a 90 to 95% unfollow rate if you have an automatic DM return for when I follow you. Because I'm like, oh, well, that's annoying as hell. The worst uh, is when they don't even remove the Crowdfire tag. They just oh, my God. <laughs> the ultimate lazy. Oh, don't even. Uh, don't even. Don't yes. I'm like, I don't Chris, don't even get about me started about that. ridiculous service you use to auto DM me and fill in my oh. name and how excited you are. Um, I think people are, are more than anything, they're lazy. It, it takes effort <laughs> and... Okay. Or they don't realize. Some people, I guarantee you, don't realize what, where, how, like, they probably think it's awesome. Oh, wow, I can automatically message this person without actually doing it. That's fantastic. <laughs> I bet they think it's awesome. Like, a lot of the people that don't have as much experience as us on social media, the people who are very it's new like to social media, tele tele crop fire, the, wow, I could automatically message people. That's awesome. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. That's perfect. It's brutal. I, oh, is that? I think that's the biggest thing. It, it, it's the same of like I could, if I went to a real life networking event, I could go to one where everyone is in a line and I can shake their hand and hand them my business card all in a row and be in and out of there in 20 minutes. 
and then hopefully maybe one of five of them call me and hopefully maybe one of them is the right time to sell someone versus walking into a room of people yeah. who are having conversations and engaged and creating context and building uh, social credit almost with each other to be able to build a relationship and eventually know you can convert them when necessary or find value for each other in some way. No one, yeah. people have trouble taking that online. I think that's the issue. They forget mm-hmm. it's human to human interaction. It's not, it's not DM to DM. It's, it's a conversation. Yeah. I don't care what network it's on. If it's public, private, anything, mm-hmm. it's two people trying to speak to each other and see if there's a mutual benefit somewhere in the near or long-term future. No, at least I'm curious to, to hear what you think about that because you have, have told me before that you know you have some you like some un, you're unsure sometimes about social media. You think it's you know a, a tricky wonky world at times, right? So that discussion about the automatic DMs and well, all that. What's your standpoint I mean, I, on that? Like I said, I. I mean, I had sort of a three-year gap. I actually stopped tweeting for an entire year because I was so disillusioned with it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I just wanted to – what, what, what was starting to happen for me, at least, is I was living my life for likes, you know, and that wasn't authentic to me at all because, you know, you start – especially as a photographer, you start to post pictures that you know are going to garner likes. And for me, that usually involved a picture with me in it. And that was a really tough thing for me to accept was people would rather see a picture of me, not taken by me, than a picture that I took myself. And so I I needed a break and I needed to um, sort of, yeah, cleanse. (laughs) So what I see, at least for me, what brought me back is I think that I can be authentic and I can I can do the things I want to do and not compromise who I am and still do this. And that's taken a lot of self-confidence and I think a lot of people don't have that. And it's the same with blogging, it's the same with, you know, tweeting sort of more controversial things. You you need that self-confidence and and that's really tough to get unless you've had that success. Before I'd had, you know, my camera plus success, I really didn't feel like I could do that. But, you know, I think for a lot of people, they just need to, I don't know, grow some balls. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like it took you five minutes to think about saying that. I feel like you wanted to say that right away. I'm just like, who, like, who cares? Who cares? Nobody cares. Do what's best for you. Mm-hmm. If you have to be loud, mm-hmm. be loud. If you have to do what you've got to do, mm-hmm. but you know, within limits, obviously. And I think that I think that for a lot of people, they just don't know. And I don't think they're yeah. trying to be rude or horrible with their you know direct messages yeah. or whatever. They're just they're just they read that somewhere in some horrible blog that told them to do that. And that's what they did. So it's just, it's about- The crowdfire blog. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) I think, yeah, the crowd, but I think that's a good point because, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring back something really nostalgic now. And a lot of you guys could be like, whoa, oh my God, magic school bus, Miss, uh, Miss Frizzle. Um, Yeah. Um, the, her whole, like, I, I think Lisa, your point just brings me up to the fact that I don't want people to, I want people to be careful on social media, but I want them, you know, to Ooh. try some new things, try some new uh, ideas, you know, reach out. Um, what was it? Uh, get messy, make mistakes, take chances. That's what she would always say, Miss, Miss Frizzle. But I, I, I think that, um, it, it, it's something you, 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 we should see more of. I think that, you know. I think it was either Chris or Garrett or Lisa, someone in the beginning of the show brought up, um, I think it was you, Garrett, about how some companies are not, not necessarily boring, but don't really are, don't do much or like are afraid to kind of 
get out of like that the whole like just regular circle and, and kind of go above and beyond type thing and and ex, like experiment. But I, I have a saying that I, I really like that I use a lot is you know we never lose like we're not there's no losing there's we either win or we learn. So you know something you do on social media that maybe flopped. You didn't lose. You didn't. You didn't like. Nobody it's not even over, noticed. You know what I mean? You're Nobody even learn. noticed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what some of the stuff that we've 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 tried on the little Leo the Morky account, we've tried a lot of different things, and you can tell like the stuff that people aren't into don't get as much numbers, and like the the numbers are really different, right? Something will get like five, six thousand likes, it will get you know not even two, three thousand. So. I, I like. I think we brought up some really good points. We're unfortunately going to have to wrap up this episode really soon. Um, but before I go, I just wanted to get some. Before we go, I just want to get some closing remarks from all three of you. I really appreciate you coming on the show, and I appreciate everyone who came in, tuned in to watch. Um, Chris, anything uh, you want to say? Yeah, any uh, closing going, remarks? Like, you looking for a particular topic to close on? Throw some balls. No. <laughs> I would say, yeah, but uh, just if, in to general. kind of continue on the note that we're just going on, um, I definitely agree that you have to be out there, you have to take chances, um, you have to create something that's remarkable that somebody's going to talk about, but at the same time, um, there are obligations, and Garrett, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, when you're working for a brand, um, there's people that lose their jobs over a tweet, um, so it's, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Remember the um, whole Houston so Rockets? It's it's a very fine line, and I guess that's it's sometimes it'll go unnoticed and it'll just pass by, but um, other times it's it be, can become a story. So I guess just using good judgment, I guess, and being able to do that quickly as well, because you need to chime in on conversations when they're happening, and you need to be able to kind of insert yourself in in places of topics that are relevant, but. Um, you also need to be able to do that in a tactful way and be able to do that in a way that's consistent with the brand that you're representing. Like when I'll, I'll look during the day, I'll, I'll be looking on Reddit, I'll try to see what's popping up and see where we can insert ourselves in conversations. But you, you don't want to stray too far from, from your brand as well because it, it looks really desperate. If, <laughs> if you're uh, saying, yeah. oh, come to this, hashtag to some random other event, um, it's... It, it's very, uh, very transparent what you're doing as well. So, um, just kind of using good judgment, I guess, but being able to do that quickly, I guess, is the key. Yeah. No, absolutely. Gary, uh, any, anything uh, to definitely add? Definitely agree any with him. I think a lot of times he's like trending topics and stuff. I want to jump on it. Don't force it with your brand. Um, I think in the closing remarks, I really, I wish we got we. Uh, the conversation's been awesome, but I was excited for the uh, the Snapchat conversation. Yeah. We were hoping in none, but I know that. We're... <laughs> well, you know, let's let, let, let's do it. Let's do it. Snapchat. <laughs> All right. So, forget I said we're wrapping up because we're not. Pop turn to bonus. Snapchat. It was just for timing. Um, we we were usually you know half hour, four to five minutes. It depends. Some some guests want to go longer. Some guests want to go shorter. But yeah, Snapchat. So. A couple of weeks ago, yep. Chris, you might know who this is. Tara Sloan from Hometown Hockey um, posted a tweet saying, all right, Snapchat, I know about it. I haven't used it. What's it all about? And what am I going to get out of Snapchat versus Instagram? I already have Instagram. I use Instagram all the time. What am I going to get from it? So the first thing that came to mind for me is the behind the scenes aspect. But then I thought that was a really good question she asked because it was kind of tough because what do you like yeah, a definitely. lot of things you could do on Instagram, you could do on Snapchat. I, but I think what the you, most attractive thing about yeah, Snapchat right different. now what, what is that it's, Chris, it's kind of a new frontier that's it's unpolluted. So there's there's no ads, there's no grandparents, there's it's 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 kind of a throwback to what Facebook was before it was full of ads and it was um, full of marketers. They've they've really kept it and this is something Instagram did for a long time, they're kinda of loosening themselves on it. They've really kept it organic and pure, and it's it's really difficult for brands to exist and really, like, there are brands that are doing it. Um, what the ROI is on that is kind of still up for debate, but I think I think what brands are looking to do right now with the network is kind of just get in as an early adopter and establish um, an audience, and then when it 
it's it's going to change over time. It, it has to change to appease marketers over time. And as that happens, it's going to be less cool. Um, older generations are going to kind of hop on board again. And then the cycle just kind of repeats itself, I think. Older generations um, so can't think, figure out the UI. They cannot figure out the UI. Yeah, it's the swiping, they don't get it. Mobile. They just like press the button. They're like, doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And then just delete it. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. I, I think... But there's yeah, but the, there's interest. It's what makes think, it um, people want to like Snapchat. Is yeah, like, old generations are starting to consume a ton on it. Like my parents wanted to join wow. to see what like I was posting because my friend, my parents' friends joined and they would see what I was doing and they'd be like, "What are you talking about? I didn't see that." It was at yeah, face swapping. Or they were he was at the face swapping. You got to tell me you went to the hockey game. He was oh yeah, he was there Wednesday Everyone. night. I saw the Snapchat story. Wait, well, his what? <laughs> Yeah, I see more of it. I think on I, a consumption base. Yeah, I think it's. I think right yeah, now, but, um, there's there's just something attractive about fresh networks, and it's they they do have something unique. I think it's it's funny if you look at Periscope, uh, like something like Periscope versus Snapchat, and how much more kind of prevalent Snapchat is right now. This it's funny if you scroll through Twitter, just looking at everybody's snap code, like every other avatar is a snap code. But, um, They've kind of they've been able to have that immediacy um, and kind of semi almost live content, but not as rigid as Periscope. Um, even though you kind of watch Periscope stuff, they've ended. It's it's just that kind of um, they've made it a little easier to keep track of of uh, kind of things that happen already. I think, and uh, so there's the immediacy and the, the content expires, so it's there for a limited time. So there's there's kind of the <laughs> it doesn't expire because you can <laughs> screenshot it and well, I've been an unfortunate <laughs> victim to that many times when I first started alright when I really ugly faces that I thought were going to disappear after 5 seconds but are on my friends phones for, li for life now because I know they will never delete them but that really bothered me because I didn't realize that that was a thing <laughs> yeah so someone actually, oh, live at live Curtis who just said, like, because people can comment. Um, you mentioned Periscope, Chris, and Gary, and Lisa, we'll get back to Snapchat quickly. But Facebook Live, I think, I think is doing an unbelievable job Facebook. of competing with Periscope. Yeah. yeah. Oh, big time. It's amazing. It's so, it's incorporated. Although with I'm very interested on, to see what, uh, as well, what uh, the likes and Twitter's going to do with the NFL Gary? contract next year. Oh. I think there could be some cool stuff like that. I'm super interested in that. I think there's so much oh, yes. relying on mm -hmm. what type of of you of user experience they develop for that, and it's. I think they could do a better job if they had the right mindset. But Wall Street's forcing them. They just they want to get new users, or they want to get users, <clears throat> excuse me, active again because they have to yeah. for the sake of their stock. And I think they could do a better job of of, of just a better overall experience. They didn't have to have that on the forefront. And I think, I think, I think it's also be like, to join the conversation now to have mm -hmm. to be on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I'm super interested to see how that goes for sure. The biggest thing I think it turns people off on Twitter right now too is just how much spam is on there. Like how many spam bots? Like it's it's just ridiculous. They got to do something with that. I think. Oh, so much. That's all my off. followers, guys. Come on, you get rid of those guys. <laughs> they don't got any followers. Did you, did you buy them from Serbia? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that they're introducing the curated feed now. No, you oh, said you said that so, was for oh, you, yeah. you said Google that was Plus for Google Plus. Easy, so nobody even talks about it. Like it doesn't even exist. That's like I was on the SUL for Google Plus, so I have like 1.7 yeah. million, and nobody cares. I'm like, guys, come on. <laughs> yeah, what's the conversion rate on those? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> By the way, if anyone was asking, oh, yeah, all of the exactly. Little Leo the Morky's Instagram followers are 100% legit. You can do an Instagram audit on him. You can go check them. The I'm not afraid like the Google Plus was just the Google all authorship the world. because, like, it made your search results oh, so awesome. You have yeah. picture and everything. Yeah. And once they got rid of that, I was like, okay, I don't care about this anymore. <laughs> But the yeah, thing too, though, about uh, Google Plus, it, it looked good. Like, do you remember the, the interface? I thought it yeah, looked cool. Gary, were you ever on um, Google Plus a little bit? 
Yeah. It, uh, well, I mean, it, 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 it looks cool. Everything else, Google. It was a clean interface. It was slightly ahead of its time. Honestly, it had it had flat UI design. It was it was well organized, but there was just no purpose. It was like, Peach had some of the coolest integration and and in in like for a week or two, like different oh. technology involved in a social network, but it served no purpose. What were you going to do in there? Nothing. It, it was an attempt to Slack is super hot right now. It was an attempt to take that type of technology and experience and put it into a social network. All it was was a distraction from Twitter, from the guys who invented Vine, which just fits its experience perfectly. There's no surprise there. Um, I mean, it was cool. I mean, yeah, I do agree. Google Plus was a good-looking platform, but... There was uh, it was, it was, was SEO a pretty, tool it was a mastering house. as a net exactly it was, it was a way to suck up to Google for SEO, but it was a big beautiful house in the middle of a deserted crappy neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> so Peach was cool for like the first ten minutes I had it, and then I got bored of it really quick. Um, I like I I don't know I think I didn't understand I didn't get it, and I think that's why like. I think a lot of people agreed with me because it didn't really take off. But Lisa, you really want to talk about Snapchat and Snapchat being a photo app and, you know, with well, I don't want to be Plus controversial and, and here because you guys are all like, Snapchat raw, raw, raw Snapchat. <laughs> I am. I'm hey, all I want, <laughs> when I, I would love whoa. you to be controversial. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's get controversial. Oh, Grab some geez. Balls and get yeah. Well, when I first <laughs> discovered Snapchat, because I'm always an early adopter, I have a lot of friends who are early adopters. So I checked it out and I was like, no, no way. Could not. I was like, this UI is horrible. This is ridiculous. Why would I? I'm a photographer. I post beautiful pictures that take me hours to take. And that's what's... You don't want to lose them right away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's what separates me from someone who's just snapping a picture is I actually take the time, I edit them, and that's part of my process. And also, I'm a private person somewhat. I'm not like, here's my face, here's my face, here's my face. Like, I, I, I don't take selfies. I mean, I haven't taken selfies for five years because <laughs> I just, I feel like I've moved beyond the selfie. No, I've done other things in my life. I've, you know, <laughs> I don't feel like that's a must. But then in the last uh, probably about three months, I've seen a lot of photographers take on Snapchat as a behind the scenes tool. And I'm also seeing those photographers get paid for that, that behind the scenes stuff. So they are getting money to, you know, talk about their shoot in addition. So they're like, I have X many views on Snapchat and they're using that. And, you know, when I see a dollar sign, I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> let me see what this is all about. <laughs> because, you know, I, but for me, I don't think it's, it's not an everyday tool because I'm going to be honest, like most of the time I'm just in my pajamas in my house working on photos. Like I am not living this life that's on Twitter, like, oh, I'm in Scotland, I'm in Iceland, you know, well, no, I'm not. I was there like eight years ago. It's not reality. The reality of my day is like, I'm drinking my coffee, I'm typing on my computer, you know, do you find that interesting? I don't know. And then you see some people who are actually traveling the world, that's interesting, right? And I think if you can use it to, to build that part of your brand, like the behind the scenes, you know, that kind of vlogging, like, you know, before when vlogging was more natural and less like, oh, I am being perfect all the time, you know, that kind of authenticity. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of people are using um, Facebook, the live Facebook for this also to, to bring that personality back because it, they can actually engage with people. And I mean, for me, I find that very difficult because I, I, I don't even like being live with you guys. It's making me, it's making me all sweaty. Jeez, woo! Because <laughs> like, I'm just not used to it. I'm used to just being like doing my little bit on the camera and then it's done. But you know, it's it's difficult to to do that as a as a person, as a brand. It's a little bit different if you have you know Gary's fine with it. He can yak on camera all day and all night. But for me, I'm a little, I'm a little, little bit shy, so it's tough to to, to do that. I, I would, I would, I would identify with your side, Lisa. I'm, I would say I'm yeah. very similar. Like, 
if I look at my normal day, like I'm I'm on the computer, I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm working away, and like I'm if you're somebody a celebrity or something, I think that's um, it's easier to find that content. And there is there's no excuse for having lame content. Right? There's there's always a way to make something interesting, but I have to figure out how much of my day do, can I allocate to yeah, doing exactly. that, and how much of it do I need to to do be doing other things, right? So for for some industries and and some people, I think it comes very easily. And then um, for others, it's more of a challenge. I think I've fallen to the ladder of that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well okay. I, yeah. This now is I think we have to wrap she's freaking out. It's hot here. Yeah, it's like twenty-six degrees in okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, Lisa, you did you did well. The podcast host is really happy. You all did well, Garrett, Chris. You guys did great. I, I mean, um, it it's an ever it's it's a it's growing. Social media is growing. Digital media is growing. Everyone's really interested in it. Um, I want people to learn when they watch Pop Alternative, and I think they're going to learn a lot from this episode. So I think this was. Amazing. I think some amazing points were brought up. Garrett, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Good luck with everything at VaynerMedia. Will um, do. Loved it. Say hi Happy to come Mr. VaynerTruck for me. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, if anyone wants to hear me ramble more, talk, chat, anything, get green on Twitter, and I can connect you to anything else you want, like Snapchat, which I love. Uh, and, yeah, CNBC tonight. It's about to oh, start a few minutes ago, Gary V. <laughs> Got to do the plug. He did. He did. Yeah, he he's up against you right now. Though. He's up against cool. alternative. So yeah, I know, I know. yeah, he did. Laugh, like, <laughs> get the fuck off the podcast. Watch TV. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least, uh, you know. <laughs> Lisa, I really thank you for coming on. You mentioned that, you know, at times you're very shy, but I think you did an excellent job, and it really <laughs> means the world to have someone like you, even though you're going to deny what I'm saying right now, but it really means a lot to have an expert like you on the show um, because, you know, you, you, you've you had a lot of success with, with Camera Plus. It's a terrific app. I was really familiar with it before I uh, Oh, thank you so connected. much. Yeah, so it's been good. It was really amazing to have you the on the show. I not the of the show, but I think that's, that's what I ended up. <laughs> oh, that's... Before people agreeing, talking about word. the same points. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you sometimes, like, our live broadcasts don't have as uh, as much, but when we go on YouTube... There's going to be a lot more people that are going to check it out, Lisa. So I'm sorry if uh, that uh, that bothers you. That a lot. Of, oh, we have a pretty no. big following up pop They're going to write me letters a about saying that check this out. It was inappropriate with a ball learn. comment. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen a few of our episodes before? We had Theo Gutsanakis from the back gob on the show, and I. I thought having musicians on the show was a good idea, but I gotta rethink that next time. And we get to clean, but we're mostly Canadian. <laughs> Profanity. Oh my god. But uh Garrett's a hockey fan though, so yeah. he's, he's on rare Canadian. Yeah. Except for Yeah. Hey, thanks. <laughs> that. Yeah. The Preds, dude, yeah. I don't know if you all saw about, because I was people the on the Preds? Flyers one tonight, which I can't believe. But more importantly, yes, the Preds. <laughs> Oh yeah, I can't believe they forced the game five. Yeah. Oh, well, the Flyers won. That's big. That's huge. All right. Yeah. But Chris, thank you so much, man. Um, me and you, you know, we've been talking back and forth about really cool things. I really enjoy your tweets. I really enjoy um a lot well, of your content you. as well. So it was really cool to ha finally have you on the show. Uh, yeah, you can no follow problem. me on Twitter. Anything you want to uh, plug in? Chris Giles eighty seven. Perfect. Well, this has been Pop Turnative. Thank you all for coming on the show. Thank you, everyone who watched. You can catch previous episodes of Pop Turnative on our YouTube page and our SoundCloud page. You could like us on Facebook and you can follow us on Twitter. Thank you all and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to Pop Turnative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Pop Turnative on YouTube. Be sure to like Pop Turnative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter.